Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 23 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. We're so excited to be reaching thousands of Tudor-minded people from all over the world. It's it's just unbelievable. What an awesome community. And you are listeners who love a story and who also love history, so you are our kind of people. Absolutely, yes. And we've had such a great time researching and imagining this project and, of course, particularly sharing it with you. It's a real pleasure. And if you're enjoying it, Support us digitally. Buy me a coffee. No, buy me a coffee. <laughs> Ty- or buy us both a coffee. Type in buy me a coffee as one word and then Tudor Time Machine into your search engine and you can find our donate page. Or the shop button on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page will take you there. In our last episode, Philomena and Constance planned a complex intrigue, but no clues about the relic came of it. We're returning to 1526 and the court of Henry VIII, where Anne and Wyatt are keeping cool with a swim. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 23, 1526, The Thames Riverbank at Greenwich, in which Thomas Wyatt gives a swimming lesson. The tide ebbed, The boat Wyatt had tied to the overhanging willow branch rested in mud. The sun made the air wave before him, and even the patch of shade gave no relief from the heat. He had eaten meat and fruit, and the wine he had drank made him drowsy. His arm lay across Anne, and he considered if it was too hot for pleasure. He glanced beside him. Anne's eyes were wide open. He could see them darting about in their sockets. She was thinking. No surprise. The hair that edged her face matted with sweat, and her skin had a sheen. She sat up abruptly. Help me! She pulled at her collar and reached around, trying to untie the thing. He did the knot and exposed her sweaty flesh. Unlace my skirt! There is no need, he assured her. We can lift it up and do it that way. No, not that. I wish to go there, she nodded at the sparkling water. Teach me to swim. Anne! Come, show me how. I do not want to suffer this heat. The water is a danger. It is a freedom. Does it not take us here and there? Does it not give us life? It was not fitting for a woman to swim. Yet the idea of her body, cool and wet, enticed him. They were too far downstream to be seen by anyone from court. He helped her off with her bodice and unloosed the skirt. It dropped to the ground, revealing her ephemeral in her sheer white shift. She ran to the edge of the river. Hold, he warned. He shrugged off his doublet. Do not jump in. Do not jump in, Anne. You must go carefully. The bottom is uneven. It is heaven. She stepped gingerly, her shift bubbling up with water. It is cool and the little current between my toes. The most marvellous feeling in the world. Except for you, of course, dear sir. This Anne... This Anne he rarely saw, smiling softly as she waded about. And yet the current was swift. He grabbed a branch that had fallen from a tree and ran to the side of the river, stretching it to her. Take this. The depth may change. I need it not. She was up to her knees. Come in, Thomas, come in. He pulled off his boots, watching the water rise to her waist. She laughed and squatted down so only her head appeared. You take risks, Anne. Do not do that. Come in and make me stand, she dared him. The mud squished around his feet. Water weeds prickled his legs and something touched his ankle, but he would not flinch. He waded out against the current. She lifted her shift up out of the water. It catches in my legs. You do not need it here. He tried to sound swaggering as he pulled it over her head, but the final tug found him a bit unsteady. His braggadocio as a prodigious swimmer forced him to stand in the cold water, playing the master. Throwing both arms up in the air with glee, she splashed water at him. I have been broiling this past month. Have not you? she cried. I would duck my head under. What do you think? Open my eyes and see the fish. Or shall we together dunk ourselves and see how we might look as mermaid and mermen? She grabbed both his hands. He hated getting his head wet, but he could not say no. Opening his eyes under the water, he saw strands of hair drifting across her face. 
her body white with fingers of surface light showing sweet contours worthy of a poem. With his hand in hers he sprang out, taking great gulps of air and wiping his eyes. She smoothed her hair back with an open palm. So entirely naked, her arms were slim and reflective, translucent as bone. He shook his head, spraying water in what he hoped was a manly, lion style. You must teach me, Thomas. Lie on your back, as if it were a bed. I have never seen such a thing. No, I should lie on my stomach. And with that, she kicked up her feet and fell into the water. He drew her out, sputtering. You must use your arms, Anne. Push the water away from you as you kick. She did as he demonstrated. Less mermaid and more overexcited dog paddling and fanning her legs, laughing and gulping air and water. He had never seen her so awkward. She who did all things with poise. Singing, dancing, playing music, making sparkling conversation. Flailing about in the water, she was unelegant, uncertain, in danger even. Reliant on him to keep her safe and protected from the current that might sweep her away. Unguarded and giddy in a way he had never seen. The thought that her fate lay in his hands made desire rise in him despite the cold water. He reached for her and pulled her up to him as he stood cradling her effortlessly, her body weightless, and she wrapped her legs around him. He pulled her onto the warm grass. Her freezing hands clutched around his back, and he whispered into her ear that she was the only woman he would ever love. Oh my, Anne and Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about their relationship and we've thought about it so much. I think Anne and Wyatt really did have a connection. And there's a lot of historical evidence that they did, a lot of the accounts of their interactions with each other, and certainly there's a lot of references to real events that would have passed in their lives in Wyatt's poetry. So I think they really did have a connection. And possibly even a a love affair. I kind of hope they did. I hope that Anne had some happy love affairs in her (laughs) life. But in this chapter, their behavior is very misguided. Right. But what does Shakespeare say about love in As You Like It? Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. <laughs> then is now people then, yes. people act crazy when they're in love. It's true. But if Anne and Wyatt were caught having their tryst, they would be worse than whipped. True, but we are in 1526 and that's just at the very beginning of Henry VIII's interest in Anne. So maybe he wouldn't be quite as vengeful and crazy as he would be later on, but You know, at this time, Anne is a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine of Aragon who certainly wouldn't be okay with this kind of behavior. She considers herself a... She was a very virtuous, Christian, religious lady who would, you know, dismiss Anne if she found out she was having a sexual relationship with Sir Thomas Wyatt. And it's interesting because Anne is in the Queen's household Mm -hmm. and Wyatt is in the King's household. And in the past, this was the way that it was always done until Elizabeth. Right, when there was only one household, the queen's household. And I think that makes a huge difference in the stature of the women at court during Elizabeth because there's no counterpart. I know we've said that in earlier episodes, but I I am struck by how important that is. I agree with you, but in terms of people getting into trouble... It didn't seem to matter that there wasn't a king's household also (laughs) because Elizabeth's ladies-in-waiting were always getting into trouble for their affair. You know, the fact is, is that Wyatt is in the king's retinue, but he's also, he's married. Mm -hmm. I mean, Henry is married, (laughs) everyone's married, but the danger is part of the excitement for them, and things are heating up. (laughs) It's true, but I always associate the Tudors with being cold. Sexually? No, 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 no. (laughs) I mean, the actual temperature outside. Like, you know, in the Tudors, the TV show, all these people taking their clothes off all the time. I think, my God, it must have been so cold in those castles. (laughs) I guess it's all those Holbein portraits with people in lots of clothes. (laughs) Yeah. Fur and layers. Italian art of the same period, even in portraits, the people have on 
many fewer clothes. Right, and the and the textures, the fabrics of what they're wearing is almost filmy and light, you know. In the Holbein portraits there you just feel the weight of these clothes. And in the backgrounds of the Italian portraits, the backgrounds also feel warm and the and the colors used, you know, it gives this sense of sun. But the English nobility, I don't know, in those pictures, Holbein pictures, they always look like they were freezing. But of course, there are seasons in England, and it gets hot. <laughs> I think we always read about the Little Ice Age. But actually, this is happening just slightly before that. The Ice Age began in 1530. And actually, that's when people began to think it was important to put glass in their windows. And before that, there are just simply records that the preceding summers were very hot and wet. Right. But putting glass in your window was not just an environmental decision. It was also, it was so expensive. It was, Glass was yes. so expensive. So a lot of people just simply couldn't afford it, no matter how cold they were. To your point, though, about it being warmer than we might think, you know, in the 1540s, there was actually a severe drought for a few years running, which again is so surprising in England, because you just think that it rains all the time. And but of course it doesn't. You know, I mean I I spent time in England when during a drought and it really, you know, it does happen. And and in the 1540s there were actually very hot summers recorded. And I just think about how hard that must have been on women. I mean with all those layers of clothes on at minimum four layers, a smock, a petticoat, a kirtle, and then a gown on top of all that. And then your sleeves that you attach. I mean, there's no short sleeves, you know. <laughs> and the kirtle is a kind of long sleeveless dress. And it would have had a stiffened bodice. Right. And But it would be stiffened not with stays made of boning or wood. That Those, those kind of stays came later. Women's clothes actually got more uncomfortable as time went on. <laughs> and your waist was supposed to be smaller. And smaller. Yeah, so so much for, like, the progress of liberal ideas, right? Because in a Victorian corset, they used whalebone, I mean, didn't which didn't give at all, right? And it just squeezed you into within an inch of your life. And the Tudor kirtle was stiffened with linen called buckram. And, and again, it was very stiff, but because it was fabric, it, it had a, a little bit of give. And... The waist, compared to the Victorian waist, it was allowed to be a little bit more natural. Yes, but still, four layers when it's hot? That's hard. Well, maybe you didn't wear hose like in the winter. <laughs> you got a little breeze up your dress. <laughs> yeah, I think probably. And that nice, cool linen smock must have felt good. So in the summer, I bet that smock was was washed a lot. I mean, especially for rich women, because having clean linen at your disposal was absolutely a sign of status. I mean, having a, a number of pieces of clothing was a sign of status because poor people, of course, would have one piece of clothing, basically. Although they might be more comfortable. But this <laughs> is true for men. They might be well more comfortable as... in the summer, but I bet they were really cold in the winter. That's so. true. And, and, and also for men. We think of the Tudors as dirty and smelly. But for the upper classes, this wearing linen under your clothes was considered both hygienic and also a sign of wealth. And both men and women did it. The linen absorbed sweat, so it wouldn't permeate your other clothes, which were much harder, if not impossible, to really wash. And I don't know that they would have considered washing it. They weren't going to put their silk velvet or their embroidery that someone slaved over, you know, and scrub it the way that they did during that time period. They Well, no, it's it's like we, we don't, I mean, it, it's like we wouldn't throw our, you know, velvet couch in the washing machine. I mean, you, you, it's, you know, these gowns were the outer layer. It wasn't, we, they didn't have this sense that they needed to be cleaned in the same way we do. I think it's a mistake to think that the Tudors weren't interested in being clean and fresh and that they didn't think about smells and things like that because of course the upper class people really did um, and you know these outer garments made of these wonderful fabrics they'd be brushed and sometimes wiped down with a damp cloth 
but it would be only the linen that would be laundered. And the other thing is when you, the thing about not washing these fabrics all the time was that you really could reuse these gowns over and over again. You could pass them down to other people. They could be reworked. They could be ta tailored. They they could be turned, and then you could use the, the you know the other side of the fabric for a while. So it it made these garments like have a much longer life because our clothes have a short life because we put them in the washing machine all the time. It's almost like having a beautiful wool overcoat, right? Like we wouldn't would wash just, a coat in the yes. in the law in the in the washing machine and we then would put dry it in a dryer. And, yeah. and so I think it's that's the idea. But the linen would be laundered, and it would be laundered often if you were rich. And, you know, London suffered in the summer, too. It was even more smelly and dirty than it typically was. And there was also plague, which was very... Tended to have outbreaks in the summer. Yes. Know. And Henry, Henry VIII, liked to get out of town and go to one of his other palaces. In the summer, yeah. I mean, then is now. Rich people still flee cities in the summer. Yes, and moving the court of Whitehall also meant that it could be cleaned. Imagine having to clean up after, what, 1,500 people and animals and food and, well, you know, no toilets. Right, so of course it was a lot easier to do a real clean of this palace with no one there, you know, without people wandering around and the king telling you to get out of his bedroom, you know. So, so they would, the whole court would hightail it to another royal palace they would clean the one the court had left, and, you know, they'd go somewhere else. So the court was actually, I think the court was on the move a lot more than we imagined, because even within London, the court would move to different palaces, mainly to clean. But in the summer, they would go to places outside of London. And that's why in this chapter, Anne and Wyatt are in Greenwich. So Henry VIII's palace there was called the Palace of Placentia. This was a very important palace to the Tudors. Henry VIII was born there, and actually so were Mary and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth used to love this palace, and she would use it as a summer residence. And the grounds were massive and beautiful, and it was outside of London, and it was right on the Thames. Yeah, and I wonder if that's why Mary and Elizabeth were born there, because the air was considered better there, and maybe it seemed more a more healthful place to, mm. to give birth, it's possible. But in the summer, there was also less traffic on the river than in London. And Greenwich is almost 10 miles from St. James Park, where Whitehall was. It, it was really, at that point, at that time, it was really the countryside. I mean, it, it must have been a beautiful spot to picnic, to jump in the water. But apparently not many people actually swam in the 16th century. No, not at all. Even though the Thames would have been perfect to swim in down there. But swimming was an incredibly daring thing to do. And that's why we thought it would be nice to see Anne Boleyn wanting to give it a try. Because, you know, Anne must have been a really forward-thinking, daring woman for her time. Since England, Scotland, and Wales are on an island, you would think that there would be a premium on swimming. You can literally swim to France. But there wasn't, and not in the medieval and Tudor periods anyway. It's, it's strange, because presumably when the Romans were there, people did swim. I mean, there are records of early people swimming, and people in ancient Greece and Rome. But even in the 5th century, there's a Roman military writer who complains that current soldiers are not as tough as soldiers from the past, because they won't bathe in the river anymore. They like to go to the bathhouse. And he says they've been spoiled by the bathhouse. <laughs> you know, people are always accusing other people of being spoiled by something, right? Yes, everyone always complains that people in the past were tougher than the people in the present. I had to walk 10 <laughs> miles to school in but the are, snow. <laughs> but are we really supposed to think that the nice and beautiful Roman baths with their large soaking pools are the reasons that people forgot how to swim? Well, I mean, honestly, I guess if people wanted, if, if getting in the water, one of the main reasons to do that, obviously, was to get clean. And if you're a Roman soldier and you have the choice of 
jumping in the icy cold water and then, you know, having to put your dampish clothes back on or going to a nice bathhouse and having it being so warm and all this warm water. I would do that too. But, and going to the bathhouse was a major pastime. It was a social event. And, you know, to quote History Today, if one considers the size of the urban bathhouse infrastructure and the concentration of the population living in inland cities in the late imperial period, in 33 BC, Rome had 170 bathhouses. By late 4th century, that number had grown to 856. And think about wow. England. Just, you know, I mean, England under the Romans had bathhouses. Yes. That's why we have the city of Bath. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I haven't studied this. But my practical self says swimming would be good. England <laughs> is between the North Atlantic Ocean on the west and the North Sea on the east. And that is some rough water. And also in London, people were always drowning in the Thames. I don't know. Maybe they, they were just like, well, of course it would be practical to swim, but we're just going to stay away. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes that just seems like the easier thing to do is just to ban people from 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 doing something rather than teaching them how to stay afloat, you know, and also because who knows what all the other issues were around swimming. People did drown often and you would think the rational thing to do would be to teach people to swim en masse. But, you know, people had a lot of superstitions. And in the 1530s, universities set on the Danube River in Europe decided a total ban <laughs> on swimming would be the best remedy to drowning. And if you did drown, they would punish your dead body <laughs> by whipping it before they buried you. So how irrational is that? <laughs> we'll punish your drowned body. No, but I'm sure that was just to set an example, and they couldn't set an example with you if you were alive, right? <laughs> so they're going to whip your drowned body, which is, you know, makes your family feel bad. <laughs> it does. Before they bury you, you're going to be whipped. And at Cambridge, you know, the center of English intellectualism, well, I, yes. there was also a ban on swimming. I mean, they didn't want those university boys to swim. And in 1571, if you did at Cambridge, they would whip you, I mean, alive. And if you did it again and you were caught, they would whip you twice, not two lashes, two public whippings and a fine and a day in the stocks for the first time. And they expelled you the second for swimming. I, I mean, know, it just seems so weird to us. It's but. so strange to expel for swimming when... Those boys were carousing and yeah. drinking and actually, doing very un upsetting things to I mean, the girls and, in the village. And doing yeah. upsetting, and also they would stab each other. I mean, yeah. it, it was really quite lawless. But despite that, who knows? Maybe because of it, people got interested in swimming during the Tudor period. Well, people love to do things they're not supposed to do. I do know that. <laughs> and I do accept that about humanity, even though I'm constantly amazed at how irrational they are. So maybe this prohibition on swimming led to this kind of underground swimming community, you know, <laughs> like, and, and to greater interest. It's certainly true that despite the punishments, some Tudor influencers who at that time were usually actually academics recommended swimming for exercise and also they did point out that it would save lives. Right, because, you know, I'm sure, I mean, when they put a total ban on it and they said they were going to whip you for swimming, of course, there were lots of people who I'm sure said that's completely ridiculous, you know. Actually, in the late 1500s, a book on how to swim came out. It is called De Arte Natan Natindi, or The Art of Swimming. I'm sorry, my Latin is not very good. And it came out in 1587. It is by Everett Digby, who was a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. I wonder if he got in trouble for writing it because of the hostility to swimming or whether because it was an academic exercise, they, they thought it was fine. I don't know. I mean, maybe people's attitudes were changing by then. And some people were challenging this idea that it was, you know, that the best thing to do was just to ban people from swimming because probably it wasn't working. 
No. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Again, even I know that. 40 lashes <laughs> for your how-to book, Avavar Digby. And a day in the stocks. Digby must have been okay because his book became the go-to swimming manual for the next two centuries in Western Europe. Then is now. It's Swimming for Dummies. It's actually a very practical book. Well, the first section isn't all that practical. It's about the theory and why to swim. He felt that was important to put in there because he's addressing people's fear of swimming, right? If he's addressing mm. the theory of the water and why to swim, he's coming from a not from the place we would come from, right, which is get directly to how to do it because he has to convince people to try. The second part is it's it's technique, swimming technique. How to propel yourself through the water. How to get in the water, like you explained to your toddler when she or he doesn't want to get in. How to dive, how to turn. Digby did not learn how to swim growing up. No. He had to teach himself. Which and, was, gosh, how daring to get in the water. Yeah, yeah, I think it was very daring. And this was a time when there was a return to the classics. And Digby read an ancient military and medical treatise on swimming. And then he himself figured out how to actually do it. That's amazing. And, you know, he, he, his, his book was kind of an act of generosity because he really tried to help people understand what he had figured out to prevent them from drowning. And in fact, this swimming manual has the distinction of being the first illustrated how-to book in the English language. It's, it's hard not to think that some people must have been able to swim. Right. Maybe they could only dog paddle if they were in the water, and Digby, you know, really refined it. It's true, but getting in the water, being around the water, it must have been pretty scary if you couldn't swim. Yes, and it's also very cold, and the water is dark. It, you know, the water in England is in a Mediterranean blue. And, and besides that, in this period, they imagined, they thought they knew that the water was full of strange beasts. And how could they find out otherwise? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't dive into the ocean. I mean, I'm, some people could, but, you know, you could only hold your breath so long and having your eyes open under the water was really hard so I mean you didn't know what was under there they thought there were kraken and giant squids and who knows what all yeah there was actually an idea that at that time that everything on land had a, had a counterpart in the ocean so there were sea cows and sea dogs and of course mermaids and mermen mermaids and mermen are a very old, I want to say, supposition. Mm -hmm. Because they really supposed they were in the ocean. Yeah, they weren't a fantasy. Yes, yeah. it wasn't a fairy tale for fun. They thought it only made sense that there were people, people under the sea. And they're, you know, people see what they want to see, or they imagine they see things that they, they think are there. So there are many sightings of mermaids. And, you know, of course... <laughs> <laughs> Human beings are weird. So if you look on the internet, there are still mermaid sightings. It wasn't, though, as if, oh, mermaids were so beautiful, I've seen mm -hmm. a mermaid. No, mermaids were considered extremely unlucky, although they couldn't decide whether it was unlucky because it indicated a disaster was coming. You know, I've seen a mermaid, that means a storm is coming. Or whether seeing the mermaid actually caused the disaster. So that was up for debate. In California, we have this constant thing like it's earthquake weather, which is so <laughs> silly, but people still hold on to it, right? So is it because it's hot that we have an earthquake or is the earthquake make it hot? I mean, you know, people still hold on to these things. But there were many different ideas about what a mermaid was. I mean, were they just a human-like race that happened to live beneath the waves or were they something magical? Did they have powers? Yes, yeah. exactly. Like the Silkies. They were imagined to be beautiful. Of course. Of course. Why not imagine <laughs> it to be beautiful? <laughs> beautiful women that mainly lived their lives as seals, but they could transform to human women on land. And if someone stole their skin, which they shed to become human, they would then remain a human 
until they could reclaim their seal skin. And there's actually many folk tales where a man steals a selkie skin, marries her, she bears children, finds her skin, and then returns to the sea. Well, am I mistaken in thinking that that's sort of the story of Achilles' mother? No, that's correct. Yes, because she's taken from the sea, Mm -hmm. and then she escapes back to the sea. I'm sure some of that those folk tales maybe were were based on on other myths that had been around for a long time but you know the whole stealing the skin of a woman who wants to be on the wa- in the water so she can marry you and have your children i mean that's a predatory tale of course i start thinking about the <laughs> half selky children what would they be would they have like powers to swim or i don't know it's interesting right <laughs> but it, she is kind of the man's prisoner i mean it's a little creepy and disturbing i mean i know they perceived it to be very romantic uh, yeah romantic and beautiful but Well, this Selkie folklore is Gaelic. It's not truly English, but folklore about merpeople is in so many cultures. And of course, you know, as we, as I just said, it's also in ancient Greek culture. It's just, you know, they're not Selkies, they're they're nymphs or they're water nymphs or they're people who live in the water. But the Scottish... Oof, that's cold. That's cold (laughs) water. They have a Merriman myth that has a kind of Christian uh, origin, which I think is pretty interesting. Oh, you mean the Blue Men of the Minch. (laughs) Do you think the Blue Men group took their (laughs) bit from that? It's one you don't hear as often as the mermaids. But the Minch is a water strait that separates the northwest highlands of Scotland and the northern inner Hebrides from the northern outer Hebrides, and just saying those names already makes me feel cold. Yes, these are <laughs> super cold water people. It's it's like a mixed myth. So when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, many angels fell with him, and they took up residence in various places on the earth. So some became weather fairies, some became the northern lights, and some became these men inhabiting the sea. And of course, people believed they saw them. Mm-hmm. And they described them as the color blue and that they had extremely long arms. Maybe it was just a thin Scottish person who was very, very cold. Or perhaps drowned. (laughs) I hate to say it. I guess that they would use these long arms to grab swimmers or even a boat and drag it down into the dark depths. You know, but all these creatures of the ocean or what they imagined were there were mysterious and beautiful And, of course, they would show up all the time in the decorative arts of the period and in the painting. Even in the Armada portrait of Elizabeth I, there's a mermaid carved into the chair she's sitting in. Mm -hmm. And that the Armada portrait is one of the most famous of all Elizabethan propaganda portraits. And, And like all of Elizabeth's portraiture, it was full of symbols. It's an excellent example of Elizabeth using a portrait as propaganda. So the naval battle behind her depicts Philip II's Spanish Armada. And we'll post that on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. It's a wonderful portrait. And we'll include a close-up on the mermaid that's on the chair, even though there's no agreement as to why the mermaid is there on the chair. Well, did the actual chair just happen to have a mermaid on it, or did they... Does it intentionally relate, yes. find a chair with a mermaid on it? Does it relate to the armada and the sinking of the ships? I like to think the artist put it there to suggest Elizabeth, like a mermaid, controlled the seas, I guess, and brought this storm to sink the Spanish. I mean, not literally, of course, but as a sort of nod to what a powerful woman she was. I, I don't think those kind of symbols are just arbitrary. Oh. I, think they, I think the artist, and she knew exactly what was every detail that was in there. I agree. But I I think they chose that chair because it had a mermaid. I, that's, I guess, that what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it was an imagined mermaid that he's stuck on there only in the painting. Oh, yeah. And I think mermaids were, and still are, potent images of female power. And we haven't even discussed the kraken, which might have, which they thought was in the ocean, which was either a serpent or a kind of octopus, but was what we might now call 
you know, a sea monster. The Kraken is another idea that has been around so long. And the fact is that the ocean is an amazing place. And discovering what's really there is amazing. Right. It's just as amazing as what people imagine. Yes. Just, and, you know, aren't we lucky we can really see it all now? But at the time, with the ocean and water in general being so unknown and deadly, it's not surprising that these stories came up. I mean, even if they're fantastically wrong, there was no way of proving that they were wrong. That's right. And we just imagined Anne was interested in all things off limits. Well, history shows her as a boundary pusher. I mean, she's interested in new texts, religious reform, new political ideas, and in time's riddle, men who are off limits and men who know how to swim. (laughs) And swimming is so subversive. Yes. But for now, we'll leave Anne Boleyn and Sir Thomas Wyatt and we'll return to Constance, who's in the Tower of London in a different year, 1565. So we're taking our Tudor time machine to then. And as always, Constance is in danger. Any adventure requires a little danger. Tell all your friends to listen and... Remember to listen in next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk.